Praise God. Well, if you uh, want to, you can turn in your Bibles this morning. We're going to begin this morning. Um, you know, in the beginning of this year, you think about how that, uh, I don't think anybody would have thought at the beginning of this year that we would be uh, going through and having uh, the issues that we are having, a, a, a worldwide pandemic, you know, uh, uh, a potential financial downturn, uh, the destabilization of practically the whole world, you know. Um, I can uh, remember uh, Kathy and I, we were, uh, had spent uh, two months in South Africa, December and January. We came back here to the States. And, you know, when we go to Africa and then uh, visit our family, but we also minister. And, and this year, you know, uh, we were able to minister in several other places in Southern Africa. We actually were blessed to go to a, a wonderful church and ministry in uh, what is known, used to be known as Swaziland, but is now Eswatini because uh, people kept on getting the, the Swaziland mixed up with uh, Switzerland for some reason. And so it's the kingdom, it's the kingdom of Swaziland, and we went to go and minister there at the pleasure of the king, wow. and it was awesome to just be part of that uh, whole uh, ministry there that, uh, that we were able to do. But, you know, when we go there, two months out there uh, in ministry, uh, financially, we had kind of depleted our, our uh, um, you know, our, our resources, yes. And, you know, we came back to, to uh, America, and uh, we had a whole schedule plan. In fact, we were supposed to be here in April, and uh, so we had this whole schedule planned, and, you know, we were ready for, you know, getting back on, on, in the saddle and, and traveling. Uh, our ministry is mainly... Uh, 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 traveling to different countries, different places here in the United States, ministering in conferences and churches. And so uh, with, within a week or two that we were here, everything started shutting down. And, you know, I mean, I, who would have thought? And all of a sudden we were faced with uh, the fact that the, you know, our whole schedule, at first we thought, you know, all, what we'll do is we'll just... Um, you know, cancel maybe the first couple of, and, and it's not going to take long because how long did they say? Uh, 14, days. 14 days, right? So, for, you know, we can do 14 days. And, and as things were progressing, all of a sudden, everything started shutting down and our whole traveling ministry, uh, you know, financially, it started to impact us. And we were both, Kathy and I were like, you know, what are we going to do now, you know? And... Um, during that time, of course, you know, that's when, when all of a sudden you realize, uh, are you living by faith or not, you know? And, and the Lord really just spoke to me and just uh, brought something into my heart that I, and I'm convinced of this, that, that uh, as believers, you know, the ch as in the church, we, we have a challenge. We have a challenge, and, and many of us have been challenged, and we have a challenge to live our lives by faith. Uh, you know, the best thing that we can do in even, even where we are right now, what's it, six months into this, or maybe even going on to seven months that we are into this whole thing, um, you know, the best thing we can do is to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Number one, number one, the reason we need to do that is for ourselves. Number two is for the people that we love, our family members, our children, uh, our mothers and fathers, the people around us. And then thirdly, I believe that we are, we, we, we are challenged to, to be the people of faith. You know, let, let me explain something to you. I don't know if you realize this, and I think maybe some of you do, but living here in America, living and being part of the American um, experience, that uh, living a life of faith can sometimes be something that you can put aside because, come on, think about it. I mean, because let's face it, in America, we, we have so much. We have access to so much. And it's easy for us to just kind of you know, uh, go through the motions and, and, you know, kind of maybe even uh, 
uh, you know, get ourselves to believe, well, you know, we, 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 we trusting, we're living by faith. But really, if you look at it, I mean, what's available to us? You know, when you do go to other countries, when you do go to the third world countries, and you realize what true poverty is. Yes, sir. You know, I, I, I mean, here in America, I mean, sure, there are some poor people, but it's not really poor. You understand? I, I mean, it's, and so uh, the, the resources that are available to us in America, uh, you know, it, it's easy for us to kind of idle our faith. And, and when something like this happens, all of a sudden now we are challenged with, uh, uh, with living a life of faith. There are other people. Guys, we, we live in, an, in another economy. Uh, we live in a whole new, a different environment as believers. Yes, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And so when we understand and, and realize that when things like this start to happen, it starts to impact you know, how many people have lost their jobs, how many people have lost businesses, how many people have all of a sudden that which was coming in uh, easily and naturally, all of a sudden, we are faced with, we're going to be having to live by faith now. And all of a sudden, we realize, and, and, and even myself, you know, uh, being part of this, having, you know, my schedule booked, everything is ready. I have, you know, all these opportunities and, and you know, ministry and teaching at the, the Bible college, the Bible college, you know, locked down. All of a sudden, I mean, everything started changing. And all of a sudden, I found myself going, oh, dear, what am I going to do? You know, and, and, and it's like somebody said, oh, man, we, we're back to trusting God again. <laughs> Amen. But, you know, the thing is, that's the truth about that there are people, there are people that that are watching us, people in the world. And, and you know what? For the most part, many of us as believers, we are no different to them. We are in, in a panic as they are in a panic. And, and the Lord just spoke to my heart that day and said, you know, the best thing you can do right now is to, is to start living and, be, and, and keep on living by faith. And boy, I tell you what, it was a wake-up call for me. And so uh, uh, let's go there to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. And the Lord really, when I, uh, uh, Kathy and I started traveling now, it's, uh, it's about the fourth week now that we've, uh, it's, a, it's a month, beginning of August, yes. So we started traveling again, started ministering again, started having meetings again. And uh, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, what do I, what do I minister? And the Lord really... Uh, brought up something uh, in me, something that the Lord shared with me many many years ago. In, in fact, I preached on this so many times before. I might have even preached this year. I don't know. But uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse uh, 11 through to verse 14, here's where Paul is speaking to a young minister, Timothy. And he is encouraging Timothy, and he's, he's, he's telling Timothy that, you know, about, uh, of course, that's where we get that the famous scripture that people always get wrong, you know, that the money is the root of all evil. You no, know, the love of money is the root of all evil. And then, you know, he's giving him advice about things, and then he uh, says in verse 11, he says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay a hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give you charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that you keep this commandment, everybody say commandment, without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, there's a lot that, that Paul is saying here, and, 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 and I know that I don't have a lot of time to expand on this, but 
when you look at what he's saying, he is speaking to this young man and he's telling him about all of these things that he needs to be aware of and things that he needs to avoid in his life as a minister and as a, as a believer. And then he says, I want you to, to fight the good fight of faith. And then he says, lay a hold of eternal life. That, that term to lay a hold of is a term that even describes and would describe somebody who is um, afloat in the Atlantic Ocean and somebody comes along and throws out a life preserver and, 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 and you know how that you, if it was you and you'd been, you know, paddling in water for, say, you know, several hours and somebody throws a life preserver, he says, grab onto for your life. Hold on to, grasp a hold of eternal life. Now that term eternal life, unfortunately in the English language, uh, is, is, is limited. So we say eternal life and immediately we think about the longevity of that life. That means we're going to live forever. Now listen, if, if, if eternal life only ever meant that we will live forever uh, in eternity with God, that's pretty good. I, I don't know about you, that, that's pretty good, but it's way more than that. That, et, that term, eternal life, the Zoe of God, is a, is a quality of life. It's the same quality of life that God himself has. And so he says, he says, fight the good fight of faith and lay a hold on this life as, as, as if your whole life depends upon it, this quality of life Whereunto thou art called. God, guys, we are called to live, experience, and have the benefits of eternal life, the same quality of life that God has. We are, that's your calling. That is the calling of the church. That's the calling of the believer. That's, that's what God has designed you for from, right from the very beginning. And then he says, he says, I give you charge. So Paul is not just saying, well, you know, I, I suggest you do this. He says, I give you charge. Right. The, the term there is really authoritative prescription. You know, like when you go to a doctor and the doctor gives you a script or, or a prescription and, and usually the doctor would put on the prescription, he would put on there whatever is going to help you in the situation you're in. And so this is what Paul is saying. I give you an authoritative prescription. If you follow this, this is, this is not something, I mean, you know, you go to a doctor and, and you have some ailment or whatever it is, and, and, and he gives you a prescription and he says, you know, th 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 there's some ointment or there's this or that that you can use. You don't go and say, oh, well, I, I, I guess that's just his suggestion. Right. Amen. No, you, he says, I give you charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Jesus, or Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that you keep this commandment. Yeah. Now, you know, that, that word commandment is keep this charge. Yeah. You know, keep this authoritative prescription. That means go and, and follow my advice. You see, uh, when, when we talk about living a life of faith, you see, in Christianity today, so much uh, is said and taught about faith. You know, I, I, thank God, thank God, I, I, I uh, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ in the Word of Faith movement. And thank God for the Word of Faith movement. And, 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 and thank God for all of the information and all of the teaching that has come out uh, over the years, you know, from the, from the late late 70s, right through, you know, even st and still today. So much good information. Books have been written on the subject. Uh, people have preached, I mean, sermons upon sermons about uh, faith and living by faith. But yet I find that even right now when I talk to people, uh, even as I experience some things, there are still some people who are totally and absolutely confused about living a life of faith so and, and, and what that means. There are so many people who are still misunderstanding this whole idea of living a life of faith. For most people, 
uh, what I find is, is for most people, there's almost this unnatural resistance uh, when the moment they decide or the moment circumstances bring them to the realization of, of living a life of faith, and now I'm going to have to trust God, all of a sudden they get to a place where they feel totally unqualified. They feel totally ill-equipped Ill to, to live by faith. Uh, and, and it's this unnatural resistance almost that the moment that people do, the majority of teaching that I have heard, now I want to qualify what I'm going to say. The majority teaching that I've heard on faith over the years now, I have, I've uh, heard many different people preach on it, uh, to me has been presented in a way that uh, makes, it, makes a life of faith and enjoying the benefits of faith available for the most part to those who are mature, the mature Christian. You know, I mean, so much of the teaching on faith is about, you know, becoming, and you know, if, you, if you're not mature enough in the Lord, and if you're not mature enough in the things of God, then, you know, you're going to struggle to live a life of faith. Or if you're not strong enough, or if you're not disciplined enough, it's all, and, and, and now, it might not be that anybody taught it that way. It might just be that that's the way I perceive. Have you ever noticed that you don't always uh, hear what somebody is saying? Yeah. Uh, you, you tend to hear what you think they're saying. Right. Depending on your own perspective, you listen to what people say through your own perspective. So I'm not blaming anybody, but, but I have noticed you know, that for most people when it comes to this, Here's the reality of life today. This is the reality of life today. This is the reality of everybody that, that, that we have. Yeah, all of us can see this. All of us can, can witness to this. And that is that most people live less than ideal lives. That's good. Think about that. I mean, most people, and when I say most people, I'm talking most people in church. Most people in church live less than ideal lives. Many people uh, are, are failing to live up to the high and lofty standards that religion has kind of put out there for us to live up to in order to be a, a man of faith or a woman of faith or a child of faith. And so many people are struggling even right now. You see, the truth is that the majority of people that you and I will come in contact with are weak. They're not necessarily strong. Now, I'm not saying that there are, there are some who are strong, but they're weak. Many people are hurt. Many people are coming to church. They're part of church, but they hurt. They, they're in a place where they're wounded. They, they, many people... Even during this whole time, you know, are afraid. I know that the Bible says, well, you know, if you're going to be a real strong man of faith, I mean, you know, you, you're going to have no fear. But boy, I tell you what, when you live in this world and you, you get bombarded with all of the stuff that's going on, uh, the, let me tell you, the world and, and the old enemy will do anything to distract you from living a life of faith. And so many people right now are struggling with this. They living, uh, uh, many believers have really given up. And really, that's, that, that's what I want to address here this morning. And, I, and it's like I'm speaking as fast as I can to get through this. But you know what? We, we'll just do whatever the Holy Spirit has us do here this morning. But I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you that no matter where you find yourself, if you find yourself in a place of, of, of being intimidated, let's just call it, we won't call it fear, we just call it intimidation. Amen. Where you're intimidated today, you're intimidated by what's going on, by what's going on in the world, what's going on in politics, what, what, what's going on right now with the elections or with, you know, uh, I mean, the, the, I'm sure there's a lot of people right now with the whole, the president having COVID, uh, COVID I call it covert. 
Yeah, it's covert 19. It's, it's got more than 19 covert things. It's this one thing, but it has this, all these other things that are popping up. And people are, are, are being intimidated by that. Uh, and you might be in a place to say, I, I, I just don't know if I can live by faith. Do I qualify to live by faith? Uh, can I really expect that if I step out in faith, if I step out in trusting God, can I truly believe that God can come through for me? So turn with me in your Bibles here, and let's go and, and just look at, at Jesus. You know, Pastor, Pastor just mentioned that passage of Scripture in John 14 and verse 9. Jesus said, and you don't have to turn there. I, I want you to go to Luke, sorry. Luke chapter 8, and we're going to read from verse 22 onwards. But, but uh, Jesus did say this. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You have seen God. Now, of course, Jesus is the exact representation of who God really is. Amen? Amen. You got that? And, I'm, you know, it's so good to preach in a church that, I mean, it gets it. You know what I'm saying? He is, now, I believe it's also, if you see how Jesus interacts with his disciples, interacts with people, with sinners, then you see how God will interact with sinners and with people and with his disciples. So let's have a look at Jesus. Now, you know, this is a passage of Scripture. I've, I've taught this in many different forms and different ways, but I would like to use it from this perspective today. In verse 22, it says, Now it came to pass on the certain day that he, talking about Jesus, went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. Now notice what it says here. It says, Jesus came and said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And he says, and then he goes and makes it very, it says, and they launched forth. What that tells me is, here's his disciples. Jesus gives them instruction. He gets into a boat uh, and he says to them, now let's go over to the other side. They immediately step out in faith. Yeah. They immediately step out in faith and saying, Jesus, if you said it, we're doing it. And I'm telling you what, they get on and, and, and they, they're pretty good at sailing. They're good at, at you know, they, they, all of them are actually fishermen, commercial fishermen, right? And so he gets, they get into the boat. Now, notice it says, verse 23, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. You know, I asked the Lord one time, the, uh, and this morning again, the Lord reminded me of this. I asked the Lord, I said, you know, what's the significance of Jesus getting in the boat and falling asleep? You know, I mean, uh, if, uh, well, yeah, he was tired. He'd been ministering. Yes, I, he'd been praying for the sick, of course. And I know what that's like. I've, I've had meetings where, you know, I've gone on for hours and hours and ministering and, 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 and ministering to people. I know how that can tax you. So, yes, he was sleeping. But I also believe that Jesus fully trusting, knowing that what he said is not only going to happen as far as he's concerned, it's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen? Amen. And, he, and, and he falls asleep on that. In fact, you know, uh, in my family, uh, I, I was reminded of this. My dad used to always say this. When it comes to a, something that he would promise you, he, say, he would say to you, you can go to sleep on that. You can go to sleep on that, meaning that you, you don't have to be all upset about it. You can go to sleep on that. that you, this is as sure as you can go to sleep on this. And this is, this is what Jesus did. He went to sleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled, everybody say filled, filled, filled with water, and were in jeopardy. <laughs> now, I don't know about you. I don't know how many years I used to read this passage of Scripture, and I would read that, and in my mind, I would think, it said that the boat started leaking. Hmm. 
But notice it says, and they were filled with water. It does not say the boat started leaking. When the, when, this is after it started leaking. The boat was filled with water. Now I want you to think with me for a moment. How long ago was this? I mean, two, at least 2,000 years, right? Can you imagine a boat built over 2,000 years ago, the technology they had then? If those boats were filled with water, it was only going one direction. And that's not to the other side. It was only going, the only direction that boat was going is down. But notice something, which they didn't even notice. Even the boat, even though the boat was filled with water, it wasn't sinking. Oh, hallelujah. I mean, can you, can you understand? I mean, imagine, I don't know how big the boat was, but let's, let's say the draft of that boat was four feet or three foot. That means it was three foot deep. If it was filled with water, they're walking waist deep in water in the boat. And the Bible says you they were full. And I can see some of you guys, oh, well, maybe. Well, let's just stay with me here. And, and they were filled with water. They were in jeopardy. And they came to him and woke him. So in order to come to him, the Bible, another passage we're going to read in a moment, says he was in the back part of the ship. So he, they must have waded through the water while the boat is not sinking. And they woke Jesus and they said to Jesus, Master, Master, we perish. I don't blame them. Listen, I, I'm, but I tell you what, Sometimes we find ourselves in a predicament in life or a situation in life and we think we're perishing and we're still afloat. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. We're still afloat, we, but we don't notice it. We don't realize it. The circumstances are so overwhelming. Okay, let me go. And of course it says there that, and he came uh, and they woke him, Master, we perish. He arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Now listen to what Jesus says to them. Verse 25. And he said to them, Where is your faith? You see, I, the other day, uh, I... Uh, left my wallet somewhere and, 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 and Kathy came to me and I was looking and she said to me, where is your wallet? Now, you know, you never ask somebody where is your faith or where is your wallet if you have your wallet. Right. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Jesus looked at them and said to them, where is your faith? Meaning... He did not see any faith. That's right. Now, you know, of course, the thing is that people will say, well, the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. You're right. You're 100% right. It is impossible for God to be pleased. God is pleased when you and I function in faith. Yeah. But I want to tell you, it doesn't mean He won't be there for you when you don't. Come on. Come on. Oh, come on. You see, I'm telling you, sometimes we've got, and we've got to that place where we've preached the message of faith and saying, well, you know what? If you just had a little bit of faith, God could have helped you. But now that you don't have faith, then God can't help you. Unfortunately, He wants to, He desires to, He's for you, but because you don't have any faith, you show no faith, God can't do anything. Well, let's have a look at what Jesus did. If you go to Mark chapter 4 and verse 37, it says, And there were also with him other little ships. So now this, this account tells us very clearly that, that, that it wasn't just Jesus 
with his disciples in the one boat, there were other little ships with them, and, they, uh, and there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves, now listen to this, the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Right. See, the boat is full of water. But they're not sinking. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. Now, one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord. I'm going to ask, and I, Jesus, show me how, you, you, you know, I served in the Navy. I served in the Army. I know what it's like to sleep in the downpour of rain. And you can't. How are you sleeping on this pillow? But he was fast asleep on the pillow. And they woke him and saying unto him, Master, carest thou not? See, it's so easy for us that when we find ourselves in a place, you know, notice here, Jesus is in the boat. But the storm still came. It's still coming. Just because Jesus is in your heart, just because Jesus is in your life, God is in your life, doesn't mean the storms are not going to come. come on. Yeah. And, and your boat might be full of water. Right? And then he says this. He says, carest thou not? Sometimes we think, well, God doesn't care. I don't know if God cares for me. I don't know if God's even hearing my prayers. It sometimes even feels like during that time that when you do pray, like God is asleep. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Yes, now notice it says, and Jesus arose, rebuked the wind, said uh, uh, to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now listen to these words. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have so you see that Jesus, Jesus basically, they had no faith. Now, you know, I don't see Jesus. How many of you know Jesus could walk on water? In fact, Jesus, when he walked on water, he walked on water where it, there was a storm. Notice Jesus didn't get out of the ship. And say, now, fellas, I love you guys. I desire the best for you. I want to really help you. If only there's one of you here that had a little bit of faith, I could have done something. <laughs> now that you don't have any faith, unfortunately, even though I love you, I'm going to just have to let you sink. Come on. So good, yeah. He didn't do that. He still saved them. You know, I tell you what, if, if all we do here this morning is establish this reality, that God, see, I like, you know, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 8 verse 24 says, the ship was covered with the waves. Right. It was covered with the waves. These people, but they were not sinking. They didn't realize it. And many times you might find yourself right there where you're in a predicament. You're in a situation. You are in a place financially. Even, uh, you know, even maybe in your, in your relationship, you're in a place and you think, you know what? I am done. I am going to sink. I'm going to die. Well, the reality is, is that Jesus never said to them, let's go to the middle of the lake and sink. He didn't say, let's get to the middle of the lake and perish. He said, let's go to the other side. Come on, give the Lord a big hand. Let's go to the other side. And what you and I have to realize, and what I want you to get this morning, and I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'm, I'm, but we're going to continue tonight. I'm going to continue this tonight. But I want to make this very clear. What this means, what does this mean to you and me? What does it mean? It means that people are way more important to God than their ability to have everything just right. That's good. You are way more important to God than your ability to have every formula just right or every situation or just to, to have every confession just right. Amen. So good. 
Listen, it's good to have a good confession. I understand to speak positively over your life. But you know what? Sometimes when you find yourself, you realize, man, I tell you what, I don't know. I, I, I fall so far short of being this man or woman of faith or person of faith. I want you to see, here they are, and Jesus looks at them and says, how is it that you have no faith? Yet he did not forsake them. And he still delivered them. He still brought them. And in Matthew, it says that when he calmed the sea and they were on the other side. The storm happened in the middle of the lake. Jesus calmed the storm in the middle of the lake. But right after that, they were transformed from the middle of the lake to the other side. Years ago, the Lord said to me, Arthur, I said they'll go to the other side. I didn't say that they'll get there in a cruise ship. You will get to the other side of this. Whatever your situation, whatever your predicament, whatever you're facing right now, whatever it is that is covering your, your ship right now, you will get to the other side of this. Now, you might be wet when you get there. <laughs> you might be wet and cold when you get there. But you are going to get there. Yes, amen. And that's what you and I have to realize and understand that walking and living a life of faith is not f just for those who are bold and strong and disciplined, walking a life of faith, living a life of faith is for the wise and the unwise. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm not ashamed of this gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. He says, I'm ready to preach this gospel to you that are at Rome also. He says, to the, to the, to the, to the wise and the unwise. You know, sometimes we can be unwise. But the gospel will work even for the unwise. Good. Uh, the qualification here is this. Will you believe him? Will you just believe him? Jesus is in my boat. He's in your boat this morning. Hallelujah. And therefore fighting the good fight of faith. It's not, it's, not, it's not having this, this bold, uh, whatever substance of faith that you can use in a, as an offensive weapon to come again. But faith, Jesus never said how much faith you needed. He always talked about how little it will take. He didn't say if you have a bucket load of faith, you'll say to the mountain. He said, if you have as little as a mustard seed. And boy, if you've ever seen a mustard seed, it is, it is littler than littler. I mean, you know, it's, it's tiny. He said, that's all, it, it, that's all it takes to say to the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. Hallelujah. So my encouragement to you this morning, as we, as we come to the close of this, I, I had way more to share here, but I'm going to just bring, it, bring this down right now because we got another service. But I want to just encourage you. Listen, Jesus is in your boat. And even in the midst of the storm, even though it's covering you or covering your situation right now, you will not sink. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And even in the times when you can come and say, oh, God, don't you care? When, you, when, you, when you've got doubt, that's what the disciples, the, that's, the, that's the, the belief system that, that really uh, opposed he, their faith, is that they, they believed, yeah, well, God's, God's with me, but does he really care? You might be in your situation and say, well, I know God, is, God loves me. Yes, because we, you know, we got this, God loves me, hallelujah, God's, God loves us all. But does he really care about me? Yes, he does. So good, right? Amen. Amen. Yes, he does. 
Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in Him.